Okay, good morning. I will shorten my talk uh, considerably given the lateness of the hour, um, but I want to acknowledge uh, the students in my group who um, have been working on this project. And it has an unusual combination of being very applied because it's aerospace engineering, but very fundamental at the same time. So um, for those people who know, would think about um, CFD's most famous um, modeling of the Navier-Stokes equations, that's not the only way that we can represent flows. And uh, the general representation of flows is really dictated by uh, a feature, an, a dimensionless number known as the Knudsen number, which is so defined up there. And um, over the region of all possible Knudsen numbers um, are what are typically our uh, continuum formulations, Navier-Stokes and Euler. And then the stuff that is somewhat higher is known as direct simulation Monte Carlo. Uh, this line is not really a solid line. It should sort of be a, a fuzzy line. But regardless of where your problem um, kind of uh, lies in this spectrum, the general solution of the problem is solved by the Boltzmann equation of transport. And the Boltzmann equation of transport is an equation which tells you how the distribution function, velocity distribution function, changes as a function of time, space, and through collisions. Um, unfortunately, the Boltzmann distribution function uh, transport equation is not an easy equation to solve. You can see from its form that it's an integral differential equation. And so computationally, we uh, have look at direct, simula direct simulation Monte Carlo as a numerical approach. Okay, so there are uh, a number of direct simulation Monte Carlo codes out there. They have very similar type of features, but the one of primary importance is that direct simulation Monte Carlo is a coarse graining particle approach. And so each computational particle represents this number of physical particles or gas molecules or gas atoms or condensates or particulates. And the assumption is, is that we can model a uh, free motion, Newtonian-wise, um, and collisions uh, in, in, uh, concurrently because we have sufficient number of collisions. And so the main workhorse in DSMC, what makes it numerically um, intractable, is the fact that we evaluate collisions between these computational particles. And because the collisions are between stochastic particles, we have to evaluate the outcome using statistics or probabilities. So while these uh, cross sections, sigma, are the physical cross sections for excitation, relaxation, or chemical reactions, the outcome is based on a statistical formulation. All right, well, most people are familiar, more familiar with molecular dynamics. So after listening to the talks yesterday and today, I added this to my talk which kind of shows you very quickly the difference between molecular dynamics and DSMC. Um, and what I want to point out is, is that the system capabilities inherently change from nanometer type of simulations to millimeters, meters, kilometers, whatever you need. Um, time scales also, of course, change quite a bit. So um, we've been working in the last few years on a, a parallel framework for a new type of DSMC code that uh, we call SUGAR. It's based on using octree AMR unstructured uh, grids. And um, we've been uh, spending a lot of time sort of adding also the uh, physical models that are necessary to make this a viable code. And um, one of our uh, earlier applications with this code has been to look at um, ion thrusters. And this is a, a certainly a, a very concrete example of the MUSES-3 has a triple uh, thruster uh, configuration. And the way these ion thrusters work is they put out a lot of uh, xenon, and they put out beam ions of uh, xenon plus. And through the charge exchange process, they uh, heat up the neutral xenon and create thrust. And so with these type of uh, supersonic expansions to vacuum, your main computational challenge is, is that you have one atmosphere type conditions here, and then you go to a vacuum. So you really want to use the octree to sort of put your computational particles where you need them. And these results show that um, this can be done. 
Uh, and now turning towards uh, Blue Waters, which is um, the, uh, I want to switch applications, but still using the same Octree code. So what we've been working on at Blue Waters in collaboration with Professor Joanna Austin, who's now at Caltech, we've been modeling her um, experiments that took place uh, on a configuration which is known as a double wedge. And this uh, uh, project was also part of a NATO study where we worked internationally to compare our results. And this is a very interesting problem because unlike the supersonic expansion, you have a tremendous compression and you have a very rich kind of uh, shock-shock interaction that occurs over the <coughs> oblique shock over the first wedge <coughs> and then the bow shock, the very strong shock o over the second wedge. Um, this is a hypersonic condition, meaning that the Mach number is greater than five. So we do um, actually model the shock formation. And it's a little bit hard to see, but uh, right along the center line of this wedge are little dots. And these are kind of the uh, thermal couples, which measure the uh, heat fluxes, which is kind of the metric of after you do all these computations, do you actually agree with data? Okay. So um, these are some results that we generated, not on Blue Waters, but on the DOD uh, high performance machines. And I just put them up there because these were generated with what I will call sort of an ancient Fortran code, which is a parallel code. Uh, but these are kind of uh, give you a, a, some sort of idea about the scale of the computations. And our goal is to essentially um, kind of on Blue Waters be able to enable at least factors of 10 to 100 more uh, capability than what we show there. And this data has to be sort of, um, uh, we, we've made some of these simulations and we did what anyone will do computationally, which is to try to model the problem as two dimensional, saving the third dimension as something uh, that you would assume symmetry. And so we were very happy. Uh, we, so in these pictures, um, the, so the symbols are, are the heat flux data and the rest are a series of our calculations in two dimensions. And if we had just intellectually stopped at 100 microseconds, we would have been very happy. But unfortunately, we went further, and we realized that we didn't have a steady solution. And the pathology of this whole thing was is that the flow was actually unsteady. And furthermore, as we did these calculations, we realized that when we reached steady state, not on the time constant of the experiment, we had um, results which were totally wrong. So um, we went on to a three-dimensional case, and the results are still not perfect. This disagreement on the forward edge is what we hope to improve by uh, running our code on, on Blue Waters and, and getting better results. But we're still in much better agreement. So let me uh, turn to how we're doing the simulation um, on Blue Waters. So in sugar, um, one of the problems when you work with an unstructured grid is, is that you have to find the surface. And so finding um, the surface uh, involves like a cut cell type uh, of algorithm. And you can see sort of the schematic showing um, the differentiation of, of the different cells. And um, when you get to the situation like where the green cells are, um, you have a split cell situation. And again, um, in a particle type of method, you have to get the volume right. And so if you don't split the cell accurately, then you won't compute the right volume, you won't compute the right collision volume. And so we've kind of um, spent some time doing that, and we've tried to do it in a fashion that's intelligent. So when the particle does hit the cell, not only do you have, when it hits the wall, not only do you have to know the volume, but you also have to have a gas surface interaction model. And there's a smart way to do it, and a way that is um, not, so, uh, not so smart. And so let me just kind of, uh, we kind of improved the way we did it by trying to, using the root cell structure, trying to find those cells that are close to the wall um, so that we could minimize the amount of checking that's gone on. And in this view graph here, you can sort of see that we've kind of thought seriously about how many triangles a particle has to check. It's not good when particles go inside the wedge, um, but some of that you know, may be tolerable. And you can see that we've sort of improved the efficiencies in a very parallel type of format. Okay, so um, just want to show you a couple of comparisons uh, for an argon flow over the double wedge. 
showing um, essentially comparison of what we've gotten running on blue waters versus uh, the earlier results. This is still not for the Knudsen number that is our target Knudsen number, but it was just something uh, to get started. The shock structure is what we expect to, to recapture. And you can see the very high temperatures you know, in, in the bow shock, which is kind of a very strong shock, just where they should be. OK, as I mentioned to you, unfortunately, these simulations are three-dimensional. And the three-dimensionality comes into the fact that if you look at the streamlines going over the body, most of them are going over the central region. However, there's a tremendous pressure relief at the edge. And the ability to capture this pressure relief is going to tell you whether the flow is stable or unstable in the recirculation region, which I'll show you a picture of in a moment. And you can see that even more that if you look at the temperature contours of the flow, they are certainly very different. Um, and they are not, uh, they're not, uh, the directionality in the span-wise direction is very different. But yes, there is a region in the center where it appears to be flat, okay? So in terms of the grids, how do you, how do you capture this? So if we look at the old way we used to do it um, under an old Fortran code, which was a two-level um, Cartesian code, you would have to choose a background cell, which was so small to finally achieve what you can achieve in this recirculation region here with our AMR ad um, adaption uh, um, code. And this is still not the level of refinement that we need, but already even at this higher Newton number level, you can see that right here in the recirculation region, which is this region right here, you need at least five levels of adaptation. OK, uh, just taking a cut linear cut across the shock, the second shock, just shows you that um, we have good quantitative agreement. Um, sampling time is a big deal in this calculation. And these numbers are not encouraging. Um, the timing of the code also depends on the case that you run, not a surprise. So we wanted to run a really strong shock case, which is strong, but still not by NASA standards that strong. And we could test the thermochemical non-equilibrium that we would expect at that Newson number. And so here I show you, um, we have implemented uh, successfully the two temperatures, translational and rotational temperatures. The degree of thermal non-equilibrium is so high that you can see that these two temperatures are quite different. Not enough collisions to really make the temperatures the same. Essentially, the the kinetic energy of, the, um, of, uh, of essentially the bow shock goes into these internal temperatures here. Um, this kind of discoloration here just shows that both codes are actually suffering from a lack of particles along the axis of symmetry. Taking another cut along the stagnation streamline, uh, the results are, are very, very good. Um, for those people who might know a little bit about this area, uh, this is essentially a no-slip condition. So the typical Navier-Stokes uh, requirement that you have temperature and velocity slip at the wall do not happen if you have finite uh, Newton numbers. And in fact, the sugar coat uh, picks up that slip, non-slip uh, condition very well. OK, so now in terms of scaling. So uh, we just started on the machine. So, um, we're, we're sort of learning. And um, what I have here are the two scaling examples. One is over the double wedge, and then I will show you uh, the, the scaling over the uh, sphere. And so there's kind of good news, and there's bad news. So uh, it's pretty clear that the sugar code, which um, uh, is kind of showing certainly improvement in terms of timing, but in terms of speed up, um, the good news is, is that at least for a larger number of ranks, the sugar code is kind of approaching the ideal result. The problem is, is that if you kind of normalize the time that it takes for sugar compared to the old smile code, the old um, two-level code, um, it's too long. 
And so at this point, we can't get to our target. Um, and then for the uh, strong shock over the hemisphere, uh, I just have the sugar code um, results here. And again, um, the scaling is not bad, but there's clearly a bottleneck that's going on here. And so what we're working very hard on now is we think it's a communication bottleneck. Load balance is, is like supremely important in what we're doing, okay? Just like the previous speaker kind of spoke about Monte Carlo issues, um, if we have particles that are not doing anything and they're just colliding and colliding over again while other processes are waiting, we have a really bad situation. But I think we will find these problems and I'm optimistic. And so I think I've almost finished <laughs> by noon and I just want to uh, thank um, the sponsors. Our, most of our funding has come from Air Force Office of Scientific Research. Um, a number of the computations started at Penn State and uh, have now continued at UIUC. And um, Blue Waters uh, acknowledgement and also the support that we've had on the DOD machines. Time for a few questions. Professor Colley. Go back one slide. I want to uh -oh, scaling. Oh. scaling study. Uh, <laughs> okay. and, and, uh, to, to make it a question, how in future, how far would you like to go in terms of number of particles and, uh, and so on, number of processes? Right, right now, our computations are using like 10 billion particles but we want to go at least two orders of magnitude higher. And, and I don't see any reason why we shouldn't be able to. 10 million? And We're using 10 billion. Whereas this is 22 million. Right, but um, there was no point in running bigger calculations until you know, we, we get this problem fixed. But my target is on some of the DOD machines we have run um, on an older code, the older code, only scales to about 60 to 128 processors, and those, those codes are running a 10 billion type of particles. And, and then to understand the problem, so you've got the, I mean, usually then when you use more particles, you get better scaling, but your problem is not scaling, but absolute performance. Is that what you're saying? I think so, but, but, but I think we have to do some very serious profiling to find out what's going that's on. What, that's what this slide would indicate, right? That's yeah. That's what yeah. This <laughs> smile code is outperforming sugar and sugar can't get out to them. It's not entirely unreasonable that the smile code might outperform sugar because it's a structured grid and there's a lot of overhead on an unstructured grid. However, if the algorithm is good, then you should be using less particles. So you have to find right. out. Mm -hmm. So if you have some suggestions. I'm all open. <laughs> I guess in uh, memory, which, which one has a better memory footprint? Which one does should code have a little bit lower memory footprint that you can scale out better once we resolve the scaling? Uh, I think sugar should certainly, yeah. yeah. All right, so let's take the speaker one more time.